Today's episode is sponsored by Berkeley Fishing, where we're going to be talking about a bunch of their top lures and how to use them for specifically bass and walleye, but most of these are really multi-species lures. Everything we talk about is linked in the description below in a single page, so make sure to check that out. Two of the lures I want to highlight that are absolute fish catching machines are Berkeley's Hit Stick and their Fusion 19 Snap Jigs. The Hit Stick came out last year and is an incredibly versatile and lifelike crankbait. You can troll it, cast it, or use it as a jerkbait, and it really imitates the action of a balsa crankbait, but has the flash disc weighting system so you can cast it a mile, and it also adds flash to the presentation. It comes in a wide range of sizes from your small trout and panfish lures, all the way up to the number 15 that can be used for musky or night cranking for big walleye. Then there's the Fusion 19 Snap Jig. The rip jigging technique has taken the fishing world by storm and is a super effective and fun way to fish. And these snap jigs will give that same erratic and fleeing bait fish action and allow you to use them with plastics like a champ swimmer or any of your favorite swim baits. Make sure to check them out by clicking that link in the description of this podcast. Welcome to the Shields Outdoors podcast, your source for information on hunting, fishing, and all of your outdoor passions. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Shields Outdoors podcast. My name is Mike Anderson, and today we are at Fishing University in Chamberlain, South Dakota. With me, I have Mark Quartz and Corey Sprangle. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit of bass and a little bit of walleye. So, um, Mark, how about you introduce yourself, start things off, and uh, and let us know what we're going to be doing here at Fishing University. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, we're out here in Chamberlain, South Dakota for the Shields University, and, and really what it is is we talk about all the new products in the industry. Um, a lot of industry representatives here, um, all the Shields employees, and then they're different from different areas of the shield store. So you might have a, a shoe store or a shoe department manager or archery manager, and we teach them and then they go back to their stores and actually teach the employees on all the new stuff that's coming out. So it's a lot of fun. Um, we get to see a lot of old faces, a lot of new faces, and just people that are really excited about the outdoor industry. Very cool. And, and how many fishing universities have you been to? Man, I don't know. I, I think it's like the eighth or ninth year. So I've been to a lot of them and every year is different and every year is fun as long as the weather cooperates. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's not the nicest out there, but you know, hopefully, hopefully the weather holds for us. We're going to, we'll be out there rain or shine, you know, learning about all these new products. Absolutely. And it's a lot of hands-on. That's the cool thing about the Shields University. And you know, it really shows when you go into a Shields store at the end of the day, that the employees actually know what they're talking about. If a customer comes in and says, hey, I'm going to go out to Chamberlain, South Dakota, I'm looking to catch some walleyes or some bass, the Shields employee can point them in the right direction and, and tell them what they need for that exact trip. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So are, are you going to get us on some bass throughout this trip? You know, the, you never know. There's uh, there's a ton of bass in this system. Um, this one isn't quite as known as Sharp and Lake Oahe, but it does have a lot of bass. But there's a lot of white bass, a lot of walleyes. It's just a great fishery. Um, Francis Case has always been a good fishery and look forward to coming here. So next week we're getting ready for the National Walleye Tour here too. So um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Good couple weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Corey, how about you introduce yourself? Let us know um, how many fishing universities you've been to what uh, and what we're going to learn from you. Yeah, so, you know, I'm from Beaver Dam, Wisconsin, and this is, uh, I believe, my second fishing university here. And uh, like Mark said, it, it's just a fun, and you really understand how much Shield spends with their employees and, you know, how knowledgeable they are because they get that hands-on experience. And and uh, so I really enjoy coming out here. And like Mark said, you know, this lines up with our National Walleye Tour event we have next week. And uh, one of the things uh, that I'll be giving a seminar on is, you know, trendy walleye techniques. And with, uh, you know, advancements in electronics these days, and especially in tournaments, and obviously the everyday angler doesn't always have a lot of time on the water. Um, with our electronics, 
we've been able to pinpoint, you know, maybe it's structure, even individual fish. And so the trendy techniques that have been coming out are a lot of those casting platforms, and maybe it's a lipless crankbait, glide baits, uh, or even some of the trolling these snap weight uh, systems now that have really been fine tuned with uh, different apps and stuff on your phone. So you can really precisely get your baits way deeper than they could ever achieve flatlining with the use of snap weights. And so there's a bunch of different categories there that, you know, the Shields employees are going to learn from obviously take them back to their home stores and, and can be, you know, obviously used to their knowledge to help, uh, you know, the customer in the store. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just crazy. The, the advancements in the fishing industry nowadays, you know, like people have been fishing for a long time and you think, you know, how can you make all this better year after year after year? But, you know, especially in like electronics, it's just crazy. The stuff that, uh, that's coming out with nowadays. So Mark, what is, uh, what is one or two products that you're, super excited about that that came out this year well i think if you look at the whole berkeley lineup um you know we've got a lot of new plastics out a lot of new shapes um obviously if you look at the past year um power bait max scent was probably the one that really stole the show on the soft plastic sides of things the flatworm um was just an absolute hit especially in the smallmouth industry um, but now you're starting to see a lot of the Maxent really take over. Um, we've got a lot of new products in Gulp. Um, we've got some new power bait uh, formulas that have actually made the baits just absolutely unbelievable lifelike actions in the water. And it's, it's really unique. You know, me and Corey both have been with Berkeley a long time. I think this is my 22nd year, 23rd year with Berkeley. And I've just watched the, inv the advancements of what's happening in the industry and where we've taken plastics um, and artificial baits. I mean, whether we talk about hard plastics or whether we talk about soft plastics, our crank bait line um, continues to grow year after year after year. This year we added the hit stick and that's just absolutely been a just phenomenal bait and it's really showing out really well. And, and so, you know, when you look at those advancements and as Corey said, um, if you really would look what's happened in the industry um, with the electronics and being able to pinpoint individual fish and target those fish, now we've come up with techniques and baits just to specifically target those fish. So, um, you know, it's the whole industry is pretty much gone a lot of artificial only, especially even in the walleye world. I mean, you know, it's it's been a lot of fun to be on that ride. So it's it's been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with the with the increase in advancement in electronics and then just moving to artificial you know you're you're finding fish faster you, you got to get on them faster and it just makes sense to really move to that artificial stuff so Corey, on the walleye side of things what are a couple of products that you're really jacked about you know like what mark said you know berkeley's had a you know really solid platform the last how many years with you know many different soft baits and uh you know, obviously hard baits as well they just constantly coming out with new things but one thing um, you know, touching on that is, you know, this year new launches in HD colors and it's not just in crankbaits and HD colors. A lot of those are those lifelike basically printed, uh, scale patterns, or maybe it's even, you know, an actual perch that's printed on the side of a crankbait. Um, and they have smelt and herring and, you know, just, uh, to name a few of them, but they've also applied that to soft baits. And so now you have, you know, maybe it's a champ swimmer with a lifelike HD patterns, the grouse pig. And a lot of them, they keep applying that in advancements that they have in that technology to, you know, creating the super lifelike, you know, realistic looking bait on top of plastics as well. Uh, but if I had to pick one bait, I think that uh, I'm excited for, for the walleyes, especially is, it, is the hit stick. You know, it launched last year, um, but at that time it was hard to get a hold of. And now finally, you know, coming around the spring, it's, it's still one of those baits that are on high demand. And then they can be hard to find in all the colors on the shelves just because it's been a great bait. And what Berkeley did is they went after the balsa action on a, a lot of minnow baits. And one thing, a downfall to balsa baits is they're super light and they're hard to cast. And, and it's just one of those baits where it has great lifelike action, but it's hard to be versatile with it because you can't, you know, do a lot of applications because it is so light. And uh, Berkeley is their flash disc uh, weighting system to really get a plastic bait that can now have rattles in it and, uh, you know, has more weight for casting, especially in wind situations. And so it can be trolled, casted, used as a jerk bait. Um, all those things um, they applied to this bait with the same action that Balsa has. And that's probably the bait that I'm most excited for. And it comes in sizes from you know, all the way down to a little three centimeter size, all the way to 15. And so there's a ton of different sizes that apply from big fish and all the way down the panfish. Awesome. So, I mean, what is it about the hit stick that, uh, that really is attracted for all different kinds of fish? 
And so I think the main thing is it's, you know, Berkeley has proven it over the years is how much they pay attention and study um, what fish like, you know, maybe it's the, you know, the sound uh, and obviously the vibration and action of a bait. And they have it down to a science on, you know, what bass like and what walleyes like. And one of the main things that I've learned, spend, you know, me and Mark spend a lot of time with R&D uh, people down there in Spirit Lake, and, and they have have it really figured out for what fish like. And walleyes in particular are super, um, you know, a tough fish to trip their trigger. I mean, they're really particular about crankbaits especially, and it's one of those things where if you can get a walleye to, to eat it consistently on a consistent basis, pretty much all fish below it are going to fall into place, you know, your bass and your smallmouth and your pike and everything else. And so it really comes down to testing. I mean, one thing Berkeley has always done is it, it just doesn't have to look good. I mean, it has to be proven that it's, you know, it's either uh, field tested, you know, time on the water or with their study in the lab, that this is going to consistently catch fish at a high level or if it's a competition bait that they're going after, it has to be better. And uh, it, they're not going to settle for anything less, and they're not going to put it on the shelf just because it looks cool. And so it has to be functional as well. And and Berkeley really spends a lot of time, and they can prove it, you know, as Max Sense came out, as Flicker Shads, Flicker Minnows, you know, as they progress, this new hit stick and everything, every launch has been very successful because it has to be able to catch fish, and it will sell itself. And, uh, you know, that's kind of the motto they've always lived on, and so it's proven itself in bait after bait. Mm-hmm. So I'm really cur- curious about the new HD colors. So, I mean, a lot of people out there will say, like, color is the last thing that I worry about. So, I mean, why why is this HD such such an important thing? Well, I, you know, I mean, it gets back to the point, as Corey was saying, you know, having not only the lifelike action, but the lifelike colors. So, you get in a clear water situation, that's really where that HD plays a huge factor is in a clear water situation. You know, if you're talking dirty water, then you might stick to your, either your whites or, or your darker colors, your dark purples and things like that. Things that leave shadows in the water that the fish can actually see. But when you get into clear water situation, those HD colors are definitely huge players. And, you know, having baits that have different actions, whether you talk about a paddle tail or whether you talk about a straight tail or you know, different tails make a huge difference too. You know, it's the amount of vibration that those baits it off and especially if you're talking about soft plastics you know in a crankbait it's all about either the sound or the type of wobble it has whether it's a real tight wobble or whether it's a real hunting action where it's going you know it'll go straight for a little bit and then it'll kick off to one side and come back to the other side you know so there's different things that trip those fish and and that's one thing as Corey said you know the amount of time our R&D department put into baits and just soft plastics and and hard baits it's absolutely incredible and and you know when we talk about that hd color last year um i had an opportunity to fish that bait and it, it was absolutely amazing how much it outfished i mean i went through color after color after color just to see and it all went back to that high definition smelt and that was their main forage in that system is smelt so i mean it was just mm-hmm. matching the hatch yeah i was gonna say in that case you're really matching the hatch and you know I mean, with, uh, you know, things like um, zebra mussels coming in, um, mm-hmm. lakes are just, they're getting naturally clearer. So, mm-hmm. you know, the the game is changing a little bit, and now, uh, you know, lures are changing to accommodate that. And it's the scale patterns and things like that that reflect the light, and that's a lot of times what triggers a fish is just the way that bait reflects the light and with these natural colors and the, the actual, I'd call it a, a shininess to them. What you, Corey, I mean, where you're getting that, that holographic look to them, it's, it's really changed. I mean, the way those baits reflect light and a lot of times that's what triggers those fish too. I mean, anyone that's walleye fish before, uh, especially trolling in any situation like that is understood on how one particular color can make or break your day. And it says, you know, walleye fishermen, um, it seems like you buy crankbaits in two, three, four of one color, you know, just because when you're in those situations, walleyes can be super particular on one given color, and that can change throughout the day and, uh, and generally every day. And uh, so it's one of those things where walleye fishing especially, color can be so important. And, uh, you know, like Mark had said, those HD colors, that HD smelt, it has a little um, exaggerated purple on the back. And, uh, but it's, it's physically a, a picture of a smell that's, you know, printed onto the side of a bait. So it doesn't get any more realistic than that. I mean, there's fathead and there's uh, emerald shiner. Spot tail shiner. You know, and just a, 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 major, a majority of the everyday uh, forage throughout the United States that, you know, each particular system may have. I mean, they went after those colors. And, and so it's one of those things where it gives you a guy options. I mean, you don't have to obviously have every one of them. 
Um, but at the same time, you can have a few HD colors. And like Mark said, you know, if you have dirty water situations, some bright colors and just really mix up, you know, what you have in your arsenal. And it's obviously going to make you a better fisherman. But like you said, um, fish can be, you know, super particular in that clear water. And it seems like, you know, it's inevitable. Every, every lake is almost going to have zebra mussels at some point. And they just keep traveling around and it does keep the water clearer. And, uh, that's where this really shines with having that realistic patterns. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So, um, both of you guys are going to be giving seminars, uh, later throughout the week. Mark, you're going to be doing bass tactics, one one Corey, trendy walleye tactics, I would like each of you to give your best reason why bass fishing is the best and why walleye fishing is the best. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, me and Corey both make our living in the walleye industry, but for me, the bass is a release and, and same with Corey. I mean, we spend a lot of time bass fishing in our off time. So, um, you know, I'd say the one thing that's pushed both games, I mean, if you look at where bass is now today, that's where walleye was you know walleye's pushing the bass industry further and further i mean the first time offshore fishing came about was walleye guys you know offshore and now that's carried over to the bass side you know i mean if you used to be able not be able to touch the rod tip to the bottom that was too deep for bass and now you're seeing these guys go offshore reading their electronics and as Corey said earlier i mean every electronic manufacturer out there is getting better and better and better and, and it's forcing the whole industry to get better. And, and so that's one of the things that, you know, I'll talk about in my seminar, but we're going to be just talking, you know, a lot of people don't understand when a customer comes in, you know, and they're talking about drop shot. Okay. What do they need for drop shot? You know, is it the right line, the right rod set up, the right reel set up, you know, is it tungsten weight or is it a lead weight? You know, what size hook, what are you going to, where are you going to be drop shotting? You know, is it out in the open or is it the, on the edge of weeds or, you know, around some timber where you want to be weedless or is it, you know, an exposed hook where you're going to be out in the open fishing, you know, roaming fish like smallmouth or something like that. So there's a lot of things that go into each technique that we're going to talk about this week here. Mm-hmm. You know, like Mark had said, um, you know, I don't know if I could pick one or the other. Like, you, you know, we both make our living walleye fishing, but if I had to choose one, I'd say bass fishing is probably funner. You know, I don't know if it's, uh, you know, better for any means, but like Mark said, you know, it's kind of release. It's a change of pace for what we do every day. And I honestly say I, I walleye fish when I have to and I bass fish for fun. But, you know, we have this National Walleye Tour event coming up here in a week and a half or so. And, uh, but me and Mark are going to head for two small mall tournaments in Sturgeon Bay as soon as we leave here. And so it's, we, we fish some bass tournaments as well. Um, but honestly, it's, it's tough to beat how a small mall fights and, it, you know, especially in Sturgeon Bay and that clear water and, you know, the numbers of fish that are up there and, uh, and obviously the size is incredible and it just keeps us, you know, fresh. And one thing that you can do to be a better fisherman is to be versatile in the species that you go after. And uh, you can learn a lot about bass fishing, you know, and having success with different techniques. And you can also apply that stuff to walleye and vice versa. And, you know, that Surgeon Bay Bass event, you know, for many years, it's, you know, there's a lot of walleye anglers that end up at the top. And, you know, a lot of it is obviously, you know, big water offshore and they're smallmouth at the end of the day relate very similar to what walleyes do in a lot of cases, just shallower. And uh, so it's it's one of those things where you can learn from multi-species uh, fishing and uh, apply to other techniques and just keep you on the front of that learning curve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find it very interesting, that whole dynamic, like using techniques that you, you know, thought was traditionally to bass and then you start, you know, trying it for walleye and having great success or, or vice versa. It's just, it's really interesting to see that. And, you know, like just the advancements in electronics are obviously helping a lot. Yeah, but advancements in electronics and obviously, you know, just getting the knowledge out there. I mean, uh, there's so many resources at your fingertips with YouTube and, you know, social media nowadays to learn new things and to apply them in your areas. And obviously you can always put your twist on them. But, you know, like Mark had said with the seminars here at Shields U, um, you know, a lot of it's talking about techniques and when and where to use them, but also the, what the right equipment is to pair them with. You know, uh, everyone could could learn the technique, but there's a lot of different things coming down to line and rod and possibly reel that could really help that technique be a lot easier to use and more efficiently. And so it's just one of those things where applying everything together, and especially with these Shields employees, is really going to help them better suit the customer when they come to the store. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Mark, you talked to, you mentioned drop shotting right away. So full disclosure, I've, I've never drop shotted before. You know, I'm, I'm curious, like, 
Talk to me about it. Well, so the biggest thing with drop shot is it actually keeps the bait in the strike zone the longest. I mean, you know, if you talk about a jig or if you talk about a crankbait, number one, a crankbait takes time to get down to that that line or that that actual strike zone. And then by the time it gets there, then you're getting back to the boat. So now it's coming out of that strike zone. Same with the jig. You know, it's down on the bottom. You lift it up. It's only in that strike zone for a little while. Well, with a drop shot, you're keeping that bait in that strike zone the whole time. So I can adjust it. So what basically, I mean, for somebody that doesn't know what a drop shot is, it's it's a weight down on the bottom. Then you got a short lead to a hook, and that's variable. I mean, I can adjust that or retie it to make it different lengths. So if the fish are a foot off the bottom and I want to track those fish, or if they're six inches off the bottom, I can move that hook around and keep that bait directly in that strike zone. So you want to be above the fish all the time. So a lot of times I start out with a foot, you know, length in between my weight and my hook. And, and there's a lot of different baits you can use on it. You know, you can use a wacky style bait, um, stick bait, or you can use uh, like the flat nose minnow last or the flat nose um, last year. That was a huge success. Um, the flat nose minnow really works good on it. Um, there's a lot of different baits, minnow style baits or, um, worm, a lot of times we'll, you know, use, uh, a power worm or something like that. So there's different baits that you can use and just depending on what you're targeting and it works for smallmouth, it works for large mouth, it works for walleyes, works for spotted bass. So it's just a great technique. Um, and it actually works for panfish. Um, that's really overlooked for panfish too. I mean, you're just keeping it in their face the whole time. So, um, you can fish it multiple different ways. You can fish it vertical where you're literally watching your graph and it's like playing Pac-Man on your graph where you're just holding that bait there and you watch fish come up and react to it and you can actually play with them a little bit, but, or you can cast it and, and retrieve it back in a slow motion, you know, just kind of giving it a little jig here and there and keeping that bait moving, trying to keep that bait lifelike looking. So, um, it's just a great technique to keep that bait right in their face. Okay. So what's a, what's a sort of structure you're looking to target? Uh, spring and then into the summer with a drop shot. Technique. Well, that can vary. I mean, it just depends on the body of water and what the fish are doing. You know, you can throw a drop shot into a bedded bass and catch them that way too. So, you know, it's really hard to pinpoint what structure I'm looking for. It just depends on the body of water. I mean, every body of water is going to be a little bit different, you know, whether it's rock structure or whether it's a transition um, or they're sitting on the edge of a weed line or something like that. So um, I, I don't like getting it. I mean, like, you know, telling somebody, okay, go look for rock pile. Cause that might not be where those fish are located that time of year. But, um, you know, my t- particular setups, a lot of times, depending on what I'm doing, um, if I'm out in the open, I'd say it's, it's probably like a 10 pound ultra eight fire line down to an eight pound, um, hundred percent tri lean leader. Uh, typically for me, I'm throwing like a three sixteenth ounce tungsten weight on it. And the reason why I like the tungsten on my drop shots is because I can actually feel it through my line and I know what that bottom content is. If I'm fishing a transition area where it's soft bottom to hard bottom and those fish are following that transition, or if it's, you know, those types of things where I can feel every rock I'm going over. And when I come over a rock, I might sit there and just shake it a little bit and keep it right in that spot. But, um, so I really like the tungsten weight on it. Hooks vary, um, anywhere from a fusion 19, uh, number two drop shot hook to a fusion 19 EWG one knot hook. Um, so those would probably be my two go-to setups there. But, and then if I get into milfoil or something like that, where I'm fishing a little heavier cover, then I might go to a bait caster, more like a, a seven foot two heavy or a medium heavy. Um, I'll go to 30 pound uh, X9 and I'll go to a, a 15, probably a 15 or 20 pound, um, 100% dry lean four carbon liter. And then, you know, there it might be a three ace or a half ounce weight so I can punch through that, that heavy structure. Um, I'll probably Texas rig it so that baits, you know, that hook's not exposed so I can get through the cover and then I can keep that bait right down below that canopy of the, the mill foil. So it gets down below that canopy and then now it's down there in the open and it looks like either a bluegill or something down there that those fish will react to. Mm-hmm. Very cool. All right. So drop shot and walleye. Mm-hmm. Corey, what do you got? Um, it's, you know, honestly, it's one of those techniques that I don't think it's really got out there yet. Um, it's not, uh, I guess, a known uh, technique too well, but it does work well. And it's just like Mark had said, it's one of those baits or techniques that you can really keep where you want it. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, if it's a one and a half foot lead or so, 
um, you can truly suspend that bait. And what happens, I ch generally use a drop shot bait when, you know, after I figured out some fish are in an area because it's a, a technique that takes some time to really cover water. So maybe I found some smallmouth jerk bait or I found some walleyes uh, casting a crankbait. Um, once I have them honed in a little bit, it's one of those techniques where now you can really start picking away and, and you know, taking your time and really fine tooth combing those fish. And so, um, you know, with walleyes in my particular situation that I've had success drop shotting in with like a number two Aberdeen, number one Aberdeen Fusion 19 hook where I just simply thread on uh, the Maxent flat nose minnow. And uh, it's, has a, it's a four inch uh, basically minnow shape with a very limp uh, tail. And so one thing that does work well with drop shotting is you have that bait suspended above the bottom where you want it. And maybe it's not one of those things where they can generally you know, just have it above them. But one thing you can do is basically fish that bait now we, uh, weightless. And so the weight is holding the bait down the bottom and holds it a foot off the bottom. But as soon as you let slack in your line, now that bait is just going to slowly fall back down the bottom. And which a lot of times is, you know, one thing you can't do with a lead head jig or anything like that because, you know, you have to have a weight to get it there. But with it, having the line um, you know, on the bottom with the weight holding it, when I add slack to that, now that bait can just lifelike fall back down the bottom. And a lot of times bass fishing, especially, and then again, walleye fishing, it's one of those things where you're making it almost irresistible where they just, now it's too easy. They almost have to eat it. And with, especially using a scented bait, like a max scent worm or even a gulp, uh, you know, they, they get close to that bait. They study it because it's, you know, too easy for them. They could get close to it and they smell right and it tastes right. They're not going to let go of it. And it's one of those things where they can simply suck it up. It's all slack line and, and you have them right where you want them. It's almost like bobber fishing when you're keeping your bait on the bottom and not having to worry about, you know, is my bait too far off the bottom because my bobber is not set right for where I casted it. And so it is one of those techniques that is applied with walleyes, but I don't think a lot of people utilize it to what it's worth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a ton of potential there. So was was that on your list of trendy walleye tactics? It, it wasn't. It wasn't yet, no. Oh, you might have to add that one. Then. Yeah, I only got 45 minutes, so we can only talk oh. about so much. So. All right, fair enough, fair yeah, enough. Yeah. So um, what, what are you going to talk about for these trendy walleye You know, tactics? so right now it's it's... You know, this time of year, it's no secret. I mean, lipless crankbaits are hard to beat. It's one of those things where you can cover water fashion. You're, you're getting a reaction bite out of those fish. And, you know, a lot of times with these lipless crankbaits, you're making a bomb cast as far as you can, and you're just basically ripping that bait up. And now a lot of times, depending on water temperature, is, is how much you're going to really work that bait and how much action, if it's moving at one foot or if it's moving at three feet. And a lot of times, water clarity really dictates that. And so you're getting that reaction. That rattle bait has a ton of noise and obviously giving off vibration. It works in dirty water, it works in clean water. But it, once again, it's you know it's a casting platform. Um, obviously, with the electronics that we talked about earlier, we can really fine tune fine tune on you know where these fish may be relating to or actually casting the individual fish. And so lipless crankbaits is one of them. Then obviously we'll move into summer and glide baits. And glide baits are basically a silent form of that same snap jigging or rip jigging with a, without a lipless bait. And so those glide baits, are when you apply action to them and snap them, um, they dart from side to side and very erratic. And as the water warms up, that generally ex excels just because those fish have a hard time keeping up with it. And so it's almost a reaction bite where they have to put it in their mouth to really figure out if it's something they want to eat. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's that fleeing bait fish deal where it, that's what triggers a fish to bite is if they can't catch up to it, the only way that they can figure out if it's what they want, they got to taste it. And by that time you have them hooked up. And so with a lot of these, uh, you know, rip jigging and snap jigging and things like that, or the Berkeley snap jig with adding plastics where you can change the action of your snap jig or your snap bait, um, is that um, basically the rod and reel and line setup you're using is really important when it comes to that because you need to have a no stretch line so when you imply action with your rod, it's transferred to your bait. And the last thing you want to have is a big rubber band that's basically making it harder for you and having you to have to do more movement with your rod to get that bait to move. And so it comes down to having, you know, a good fluorocarbon, obviously, like you talk about zebra mussels, a lot of the Great Lakes, and a lot of these baits are smashing back down into the rocks, into the zebra mussels. So you want to have a good stout fluorocarbon that's going to hold up to that. And then also that no stretch line. So when you're making these bomb casts with these three quarter to one ounce baits, a lot of times, I mean, it's way out there. You need to have a good hook set. Um, if that fish bites at the end of your cast, and it does a lot, especially in clean water, I think a lot of times it's, you know, that first couple rips after you drop that bait in the water, after that super long cast, you know, I really think they can see that bait come down there. And they're almost always, you know, heading over that direction, that bait hits bottom, and then all of a sudden you rip it back up. And that bite always comes at that, as that bait's returning the bottom. So they're trying to catch it quick and swim underneath it and grab it before it hits bottom. 
Uh, especially on the Great Lakes, it's what the Gobies do a lot. The Gobies always, you know, they won't raise off the bottom too much, but as soon as anything comes around, they are getting straight back to bottom, and that's re- realistically the only time a fish, especially a walleye, has a chance of getting it. And uh, so that's just a few of the things we we'll talk about in that seminar there. Um, but it's just one of those super efficient techniques that, you know, that especially with minimal time on the water, but also reacting and getting that fish's aggression when they may not want to bite uh, often proves to be one of the go-to techniques for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, j- I just started getting into the rip jigging for walleyes and man, it's a lot of fun. You know, <laughs> it, it takes a while to get used to kind of develop the cadence and it's always, you know, you're learning every time you're on the water. But when a fish hits it, like, they're angry. They so. blow slack in your line and you know what's happening. Yeah, a lot so. of times it's like, you know, you, you'll do your, your jig up and down. And when you're ready to, when you're ready to, you know, give it another dart up, it's like, it's on. Yeah. So, oh. yeah, yeah, it's, it's super it, fun. It's one of those things for the last how many years now from tournaments. It's, I mean, it's almost one half of the events. I mean, we might be on the Great Lakes somewhere where it's, it's been an open water trolling bite for the last 30 years. And you know, with the all the mapping nowadays and electronics, it's just it's come down to a massive body of water. There's guys casting out there and winning tournaments and winning a lot of them. And and even in our big tournaments, I'd say half the events now the last how many years have been won in casting of some sort, even if it's on a Great Lakes. And mm-hmm. yeah, it just really pays to think outside the box. Um, so you know, moving back to the lipless crankbaits. So um, when you when you're gonna fish with one of those, are you are you going through waters, discovering where fish are, or are you usually like driving around and you're not going to throw a line in until you find fish? And to me, uh, it's probably the last one. I'm, I'm going to drive around. Um, and I do that for, it doesn't matter what technique it is, because I want to understand when I do get my line wet that I'm, you know, fishing either a high percentage area or I understand where I need the cast or where I need the troll or fish. I think the biggest mistake that people make is they just get on the water, they're excited and they just want to get their lines wet and start fishing. And a lot of times, you know, maybe an area that um, they maybe they know or maybe it's not, but it takes more time to fish than it does to drive around and find, you know, the high percentage area. Or maybe I'm marking fish and know that when I do drop my lines in the water that either I'm on a high percentage spot, there's some big boulders here, it's the end of a point, I know exactly how it lays. So when I get my lines wet or I mean, maybe I mark something. So almost every spot I fish, I generally always map out first. And these are so I understand that there's a big pile of rocks over here. Maybe there's a little sand trench there. Um, and just understand the differences. It, it could be, you know, there could be a, like the Missouri River here. There's many different creek arms and many different points that extend all the way down this thing. And finding the differences on every one of them or what's, you know, what their makeup is. If it's just all sand, it looks good on a lake map. But when you drive over it and it's just pure sand and there isn't a rock on it, you know, I want to know that before I start fishing because it's it's really easy to catch fish when you're around them. It's a lot harder when you're not around them, right? And so it comes down to using every tool we have in our boat to just be as fit, efficient as possible. Mm-hmm. Makes perfect sense. All right, um, Mark, so we talked, to, we talked about drop shotting. Um, another Bass 101 tactic. What else you got? Well, crankbaits. I mean, crankbaits is probably, um, I don't want to say more than one of the most underutilized. I mean, if you look at the elite series, most of those tournaments are one on crankbaits or, or some type of moving bait. So um, crankbaits, you know, the neat thing about crankbaits is Corey said, you know, with our weighted disc system that we have in baits, we're able to get baits down deep and they're a smaller profile bait. So whether you talk about the diggers or the dredgers, um, some of our new jerk baits that are coming, um, a lot of different baits have this weight system in them. And it gives those baits just incredible action. So um, the cool thing is I'm tar- able to target fish anywhere from basically zero foot all the way down to um, 25, 30 foot, you know, depending on the line I'm using or depending on the length of cast or things like that. So I have a wide range of availability to me and, and to be able to use that in certain situations and understand what the water depths are and, and what I'm trying to target. So, you know, if I'm sitting in, example, you know, seven foot of water and I'm, I want a bait to really dig into the bottom, I'm going to use an eight foot crankbait. Well, if I want it to stay up above the bottom a little bit, I'm going to use like a 6.5 or something like that. So, um, you know, the Fritz side's one that's that's been a, a huge hit here the last couple of years. And, and that bait there, it's a, a real flat sided crankbait. It has a, a square bill on it. So it really deflects off of structure really well, whether it's rock or wood or whatever it is. And that's really what you want. And a lot of times that's what triggers the fish. But the biggest thing I can tell people is make that retrieve erratic. You know, it's just not a cast out there and bring it in and retrieve it. 
Um, a lot of times what happens is a fish gets behind it. And if you pause it or speed it up, give it a couple quick cranks real quick, or, you know, maybe find some structure to bounce it off of, that's when you get bit. And it's because it changed directions. So um, what those fish think when they're coming up behind it and it's just going in a straight line and all of a sudden it does something erratic, they think it's trying to get away from them and that's when they strike it. So um, doing those types of things really, you know, give you the ability to catch more fish on a crankbait. Okay. What's your favorite cadence to use? Do you have like a certain go-to or is it just going to be all dependent on the structure around you? You really got to let the fish tell you, you know, and there again, uh, knowing the structure that you're fishing, as Corey said, paying attention to your electronics and knowing the structure you're fishing, that really changes it too. So let's say, for example, out here in Chamberlain, you know, the fish are on the rocks right now. So if I'm going to go cast those rocks, I know that it's real shallow up top and then it goes down fairly steep. So I need a steep diving crankbait, but what's gonna happen is when I cast it up to that shoreline, I'm gonna start that retrieve real slow and just kind of follow those rocks down. And then when I get to the base of those rocks, then I can speed it up and get that bait to dive its full you know, ability. So going slow is gonna keep that bait up in the water column, you know, and, and whether you throw it on a fluorocarbon or whether you throw it on a mono or whether you throw it on a braid, that's gonna change that bait's action too. I mean, it's gonna allow that bait to either get deeper with the fluorocarbon um, a braid's going to allow it to get a little bit deeper because of the thinner diameter or a monofilament, which is going to keep that bait up a little higher than what it's typically dives to because that monofilament floats. So, you know, there's, there's ways to change things and uh, the ability to change things just in changing those types of presentations. I think one thing to add to that too is, you know, we've talked about a bunch in this uh, podcast is, you know, the technology advances in electronics, but it, it comes down to crankbaits as well. Um, you know, back in years past, I mean, this was 30 years ago, you started out with a chunk of wood that you just shaved off of, and that was your crankbait. I mean, they didn't have a lot of technology into it. They tried to make it wiggle and move and, you know, look like whatever they wanted it to be. And, and uh, you know, we talked about earlier, just the amount of time that, especially a company like Berkeley spends at developing things. And, They've really started to figure out and, you know, it's been for years and they've come out with the Fritz side and these different bass crankbaits that have really shined right out of the box. And the reason for that is they've been able to match up sounds with actions to, you know, each particular species like we talked about. And it's the same with our walleye um, deal. And, you know, on, you know, we just were at their championship last year at Lake Erie and Lake Erie has been notorious for, you know, a crankbait bite early and then a crawl, spinner crawler harness bite all summer. But it's gotten to the point where almost hardly anyone uses a crawler harness anymore because there's so many crankbait options out there now that have kind of filled the voids that we never had 10 years ago. And it's turned into almost a solely crankbait bite just because you haven't needed to put a worm in the water because the crankbaits have gotten better. And so it's one of those things, the same with bass fishing as well. And, and on the whole crankbait lineup uh, throughout the country is that everything has been advancing, even crankbait technology and really understanding what, f what sets a fish off and what they like, you know, cosmetically and all the way down from the sound and vibration and, you know, t water temperature plays a big key in that. And that's why, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, well, what crankbaits is the best for walleye? What crankbaits is the best for bass? And a lot of that comes down to actions based off of water temperatures and the same with plastics and, you know, a, a lot of times, uh, you know, the colder the water is, the slower the action needs to be for doesn't matter what species, you know, a lot of times it's more roll, uh, but slower. And, you know, a lot of times as the water warms up, especially for walleyes and then again for bass, you know, you just want a faster action bait as the water warms up. You know, their metabolism's faster, they're uh, more active, and the bait fish that they're generally going after are doing the same thing. And so a lot of times you need to have an array of baits that are going to cover that spectrum of actions and having them on a roll that they need based off of water temperatures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, gone are the days or, you know, every crankbait's the same. There's so many technique specific ones and it's just, it's really cool to see just all the advancements. So it, it is, it's very difficult to just say, you know, and when we talk about sound, I mean, there's so many different sounds that different crankbaits make, you know, whether it's a one knocker, you know, where it has just a real deep dunk, 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 or if it's multiple rattles that has a, ch -ch 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 -ch, you know, so those things are the things that, you know, paying attention to what, how fish are reacting, you know, a lot of times got, you know, you and your buddy are out fishing and he's catching more fish in you and you're like, okay, what are you doing? Well, maybe it's a different crankbait or maybe it's the sound that that crankbait's making. It might be the same color, but it's a different crankbait with different rattles in it. So there's a lot of different things that go into, you know, what triggers fish. Um, and sound, as Corey said, is one of them. It's huge. 
I mean, the sound can be changed, you know, just by the materials of what the BBs are made out of or what the rattles are. I mean, there's glass and there's tungsten, and there's brass, there's lead, there's steel, there's hollow ones. I mean, it's so sound can be made with a lot of different materials and be, can be changed up. And, you know, obviously there's plenty of silent baits that are just all action oriented. And, and so there's so many different options that you have throughout the spectrum of a crankbait that can literally make that bait, you know, perform at its highest, highest level. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, sound is really one thing I've never given a ton of thought into. I, I mean, yes, rattling is going to attract fish, but is there sort of like a, a formula or like a, a 101 for sound, how it impacts fish? No, that's just a day on the water. I mean, letting the fish tell you and, and paying attention to what the fish are telling you. You know, one of the reasons why I use so many tungsten weights, and, and Corey does too a lot of times, is because every time they touch a rock, it's ticking off the bottom. Well, you know, I'm putting the advantage in my court because that fish knows where that bait is, especially in a dirty water situation or whatever the situation may be. I'm allowing that fish to understand where that bait's at. And the second thing is I can actually tell what that bottom is. You know, if, if it's not where those fish are relating to, because all of a sudden there's a soft bottom there, I'm going to reel that bait in real quick and get to the next spot. So there's a lot of things I can learn just from even that weight. But the reason why that weight's so important is because I can feel it through my whole setup that I'm using, whether it's fluorocarbon line, whether it's a braided line, um, or whether it's, you know, the rod sensitivity that I'm using. So there's a lot of things that go into that whole, you know, pyramid of things i'm doing yeah so the tungsten's a lot a lot more dense and so it just transfers through the line a lot better versus lead that's you know obviously you know everyone, most of us know lead is pretty soft which is you know for one it has a quieter noise because it's dampened because the material softer but to me when it comes to just if there's a general idea on especially on the walleye side of things uh, for rattles um, generally the bigger deeper rattling baits are generally your you know early in the year water is below 50 degrees or so um, especially 45 or less, you know, you want those, you know, not super high pitch rattle baits generally, especially for trolling. Now, if it's this lipless casting, you know, where I'm trying to get a reaction, you know, that's when a lot of times those high, you know, high action, high noise is just going to give me a triggered bite. Um, but if it's just a straight retrieve cast or trolling, a lot of times it's that deeper, darker noise. And then as you go progress through up warmer water, it's those high pitch rattles, a lot of them just trying to create a lot of commotion to trigger that fish. And so, it comes down to, you know, crankbaits is speed. If you can change the sound or the action of a lot of these baits based off of speed as well. And so it's kind of, uh, you know, one of these things that's fun about fishing is there's no right and wrong way to do it. And so, especially in the springtime, you know, you might have a morning starting off at like out here where it's in the, you know, 20s in the morning. Uh, the water temperature just dropped but if you have a nice sunny warm afternoon you know what they wanted in the morning might be the opposite end of the spectrum as in the afternoon when the water warms up five degrees or so and those you know those fish are set up and feeding and so um, it's just one thing to pay attention to fishing is that there's obviously a, a lot of different things that you need to think about and, and and it's not something that necessarily you always have to think about when you're trying to figure out a fish but when you are having success is is to understand maybe what what is different from what's not having success Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the wonderful thing about fishing is no two days are the same. I mean, what yeah. can be working awesome yesterday doesn't work today or, you know, vice versa. Yep, exactly. And that's what makes it fun. And that's what, to me, you know, it's not always about catching fish. It's about trying to figure them out. And that's what I love about fishing tournaments is because, you know, you go to these bodies of water. I've never fished a tournament at Chamberlain here. The only time I've ever been here is for Shield University before. So I'm going on a new body of water, you know, trying to figure out new spots and obviously some techniques that are going to work. But, you know, I always say no one, whoever wins this tournament isn't the best angler. You know, it's generally who, who is, who's made the best decisions for that tournament because it's different every day and the fish change. You could fish here for a month and, uh, you know, go into the tournament knowing that, you know, I got this whole place figured out, but every day is different and maybe the color changed or maybe those fish moved and whoever adapted on day one of the tournament and on again on day two is going to be the overall winner. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best angler, but tournaments are generally one making the best decision. And that's no different than every other day on the water. If you're just a, you know, a local fisherman out on the same body of water, you fish as your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd assume a little bit of luck's got to be in there, too. <laughs> There's always luck, you know. You never know, you know, what fish is going to be on the end of that line when it does bite. But, you know, the, the understanding the right techniques and, you know, really understanding when you do catch fish on where they're coming from. And you'll start to figure out 
um, patterns where, you know, maybe the bigger ones are relating to this, um, you know, this particular, you know, rock complex where it's shale rock versus those big boulders, but it's, you know, maybe the small ones are in this depth and the big ones are deeper. So you start to figure out a few things and that's what tournament fishing does is it, it really pushes you to, you know, figure things out faster because you obviously have a lot of money on the line. And uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, you know, your credibility is on the line. For me and Mark, we've done this for a living for a long time. And, uh, you know, you need to be successful at the end of the day to, you know, obviously for one, pay bills and two, keep your credibility. And, and obviously we're both competitive. We want to win and we might not, you know, be happy to win the tournament, but the guy sitting next to you, your buddy, or, you know, I want to beat Mark and I got a plenty of buddies that I want to make sure I beat, you know, that are on tour. And so, you know, if you don't win the tournament, you just want to be the best you can be that day. And so it's, it's always fun. It's great camaraderie fishing tournaments. We all get along and, uh, but we all definitely have our buddies that we want to make sure we beat every time. <laughs> For sure. So are you guys going to be in the boat together? Are you going to be in separate boats going no, against it's a, each other? Yeah, it's a pro-am. So each day we draw a different amateur. So me and Corey have been competitors a long time ever since Corey fished. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's an interesting deal. So it's a pro-am and, and, our amateur is actually our partner for the day and our weights combined. So I want to teach my co-angler um, the techniques that I'm using and how to present it the right way. So, you know, his weight counts towards me too. So, I mean, we're a team for the day. And so it, there's a huge strategy in that, you know, I mean, I want to give him the best equipment. I want to teach him how to catch the fish properly. And, and so, you know, I, we put all the advantage in our court by helping them get better as the day progresses. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants to get into this, um, you know, like, how do you recommend doing that? You know, like in, in amateur in your boat, how does that work? You know, for the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for the National Walleye Tour in the soil on the Coangler side, I mean, honestly, anyone can sign up. And uh, it's so it's $500 for a tournament. Um, and so what I always say is, so it's two days of fishing. I mean, you can hire a guide, you know, depending on the body of water, that might be $300 a day to $500 a day, depending on what body of water it's on. And so you're basically going out on the water with, you know, a guy that's definitely been there for a week, has a lot of money on the line. You know, it might be baits that aren't even on the market that your pro is using. It might be a technique that, you know, no one's talking about, but you're going to have on uh, or have a hands-on experience on to, you know, what that guy has going on. You know, it could be some of the, you know, it could be a Gary Parsons. It could be a Hall of Fame angler that's, you know, it's a once in a lifetime. You're going to have a chance to fish with them. Uh, but at the end of the day, you have a chance to win money too. And so I believe uh, co-anglers are up to now, what, like eight, 10 grand or something like that. And uh, they can win boats out of the end of the year championship. But you're basically in the boat with these guys where they're not going to hold anything back because obviously we're going to do everything we can, you know, to win, you know, when it comes to baits, if it's a technique that no one's talking about as a bait that's not on the market and, and if it's working, we're going to be using it. And so you can learn really fast. And, you know, like Mark said, we're working together to catch our five fish in the way the heaviest weight we can. And uh, so it's one of those things where, you know, it might just be a big fish technique because a lot of places we go to, we can't call. And so once that fish goes in the live well, it has to stay there. And so uh, you can obviously learn very fast. And like I said, you know, $500, you know, seems like it could be steep. But when you start to think about it, two days on the water, you know, uh, two days for a guide is going to cost, you know, that or more. But at the end of the day, you could win, you know, money. The top quarter of the field gets paid out for the co-anglers as well as the pros. And so you're getting your money back at the last check. And, you know, so you could fish all year and, you know, make money at the end of the day as a co-angler. Very cool. Um, and literally all you do is show up with your lunch and your rain gear. <laughs> I mean, that's it. Nice. We supply all the equipment. Everything's ready to go when you jump in the boat. So, yeah, it's 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 pretty it's pretty cool for them. Mm -hmm. Are the koi anglers? anglers generally like local to that area then or no, not necessarily no they travel from all over the country to do this so i mean you'll get guys as far south as texas guys far east as new york and as far west as california so i mean the guys travel from all over to do it and it's it's a great you know opportunity just because um you know there's a lot of guys that do it a lot a lot of younger guys that do it that are you know aspiring to be a tournament angler at some point but obviously um, it's a great way to get in the boat and really learn and understand techniques that maybe that you don't excel at or go to bodies of water you've never been to and, you know, get your feet wet a little bit. And, you know, obviously on, you know, someone else's money in the tournament, uh, you know, the professional has been there for generally, you know, five, 10 days sometimes. And so there's a lot of guides that do it that, you know, not as a calling side, but as a pro. So, I mean, the guys that are generally signed up for a pro, you know, have enough experience that, you know, years you can learn something from them. And a lot of guys will even say like, well, that you guys are at Lake Erie and everyone's trolling. 
you know, what am I going to learn? Honestly, there's so many different uh, uh, little things you can take from open water trolling with planer boards. And, you know, if it's a snap weighting system or crawler harnesses, wherever it may be, we, so many of us do it different. I mean, I'd mm -hmm. love to be in the boat with a few different guys to just, you know, pick little things that they do. Maybe it's letting the board out or, you know, how they uh, operate as, you know, a fish is coming in because there's so many little things that can make a lot of things, you know, make or break that technique and, you know, be a lot more hassle-free, I guess, you'd say, especially in big waves. And so there's just so much that can be learned, but you have the, you know, the older guys that, you know, just love fishing that want to be in the boat every day, but you have a lot of co-anglers that are young and up and coming guys that, you know, just want to learn really quick before they hop in the pro side. Mm -hmm, makes sense. Have uh, either of you ever had an instance where you learned something from the co-angler? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think you really, I mean, any day you're on the water, you have to force yourself to learn something new and, and to pay attention. And a lot of time, you know, I've had it numerous times where I'm fishing really aggressive and you look over at the co-angler and he's catching a few fish and, and what it boils down to is he's fishing a little bit slower, uh, not so aggressive. And so you pay attention to small details like that. I'm always trying to figure out how to get that next bite. And a lot of times it's just small little, you know, things like that that really make or break it um so that's the biggest one i'd probably say i see more than more so than not is i'm fishing a little bit more aggressive Corey fish the same way i mean fish really aggressive in a lot of situations and all of a sudden you look back and your co-angler's caught a couple of fish and you're going okay what's going on here and you pay attention and or he's reeling faster or reeling slower or whatever it may be yeah and so like you know like getting back to guys that do it too and you know, there's plenty of dudes that have had a ton of experience on maybe the body of water that you've been to, but they just maybe want to learn new spots. But, you know, I know it's a guy that's here. John Hoyer is going to be at Shields University here. Hoyer came up from the co-angler side. You know, granted, Hoyer was a super accomplished musky fisherman, and uh, but he hopped in on the co-angler side, and he actually traveled with me for quite a while on our team. And uh, John was a co-angler. You know, obviously, he knows how to fish, but he learned, a, you know, a ton fishing. I think it was like three years or maybe almost four years as a co-angler. Uh, before he made his jump into the pro side and uh you know he had a ton of success in the first few years that he fished on the pro side and you know a lot of it is you know just the amount of time he spent in the boats with a bunch of you know different people on the on the pro or on the co-angler side and so it, it makes that transition over to on the pro side because you know the you know how the event is ran you know how takeoff is happens at every national wide tour and it kind of just gets your feet wet so when you want to make that jump on the pro side but you know hoyer is a classic example how you know, he learned through the basically the ranks of the walleye side on the co-angler, had success as a co-angler, and moved it and transitioned right on the pro side. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, anyone can do it as long as you have the drive and the passion for it, right? Passion's key, and drive is probably right after that. It's one of those things where, you know, if, it, if this isn't fun for you and, you know, you don't have that where you can't sleep at night trying to figure out what I need to bring to this tournament or, you know, what I need to have ready or what I'm going to do tomorrow, I mean, that's what, you know, keeps you at the top because, you know, you have to have that drive because, let's face it, like, you know, money comes and goes. You know, if you're doing it for the money, it's going to get old after a while, but if that passion that's in you for hunting and fishing and just trying to figure that out and that's what's going to keep your drive there for at every event no matter if you think you're going to win it going into that tournament or if you think you can't even catch a fish. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So, Mark, Corey, you know, greatly appreciate your time. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to listening to your seminars here. So I've, I feel like we've, we've talked a decent a bit about it, but uh, I'm looking to hear all the ins and outs and then uh, – Looking forward to all the Shields experts, too. So then, you know, you hear all of it, you just got to head into one of those Shields stores, and then you can get the get the full recap. Exactly. And, you know, I look forward to, you know, spending time with some of the guys in the boat. And, you know, it seems like a lot of these Shields employees are, you know, super excited about fishing and passionate about it. And so it all makes sense of why they work at the store they do. And, you know, and I appreciate you having us on the podcast here today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. You bet. Thanks for having us. Uh, we appreciate it. And looking forward to the week. You just heard our session with professional anglers Mark Quartz and Corey Sprangle, filmed at Shields Fishing University in Chamberlain, South Dakota. Mark and Corey touched on some of Berkeley's best lures to help put more fish in your boat or on the bank this season. As mentioned in the beginning of this podcast, we have all these lures linked in the description below and also linked in our Facebook and Instagram posts. So click that link and either add them to your card on Shields.com or show that page to one of our Shields experts when you stop by your local store, and they can help you find exactly what you need. 
And with that, we want to thank you all for listening. Wish you the best of luck on the water and see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Shields Outdoors podcast. Stay tuned for future segments and visit our social media pages, Shields Outdoors on Facebook and Instagram for daily updates.